Dirk, uh, great week that's been happening at the moment, Zimbabwe Under-17 uh, Cricket Week. What's happening there? Yeah, it's been great. Uh, we've been able to get all the provinces into Arari and uh, Eagles have had two teams and, and probably mainly because it balances the tournament with six uh, teams that will play against each other over our five days. It's quite intense. Uh, it's a lot of cricket for the boys, but I think we need that. I think we need our youngsters playing more cricket. I don't believe that our school structures is offering enough of that. And if we can complement what the schools are doing and, and give those boys more, uh, that's what we need to do, and I think we've achieved that. And even in looking at that, uh, you know, it's, it's giving different combinations, going into a different type of camp, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know if we should be looking at that yet. I, I think the idea is, you know, you, you've got January 2026 when the World Cup is on. I think it's important for the selectors in Zimbabwe cricket to understand where our cricket is at junior level, uh, where we want to take it and what the plan is. So. You know, the, the ideal situation is that every school holiday, so April, August, December, is that we're playing into provincials. The, the other idea is to see if we can extend uh, these tournaments into other age groups, so maybe an under-15 tournament, an under-13 tournament. Uh, but it was important that we got this first one done, uh, understood the modalities. We haven't done it for a long time. Uh, so for me, this is just a start. Maybe the selectors have a different idea that they'll narrow down what they've seen. Uh, six cricketers times 14, 80 plus cricketers from around the country that have come and, and participated. Yes, there are some away, some that are injured that, that might be included in time. But I think it's important that we start the ball rolling. So for me, what we're trying to achieve at the moment, uh, I'm not too concerned about that. It's just making sure that these youngsters are playing cricket and that we can develop from there. And uh, if you're looking at that concept you're talking about, if uh, a, a young player doesn't perform as well right now, they have a ch another chance in August, another chance in December to just be in an environment where they're playing consistent cricket against players that they're not used to playing against. Yeah, I, I think there's an element of taking them out of their comfort zones. You know, when you play for a school, whether it's St. John's, St. George's, Milton, you're playing with people that you know all the time. Uh, you know, coming to Harare for a week of uh, condensed hectic cricket takes you out of that comfort zone. It, it toughens you up. It makes you realize what's needed. You're also playing with boys that, that potentially you don't know. Uh, and I think that's important for development away from the general bat, bowl and field. Um, so that's, that's one issue. Um, you know, we... We as Zimbabwe cricket also need to have a look at uh, the implications of trying to play a lot more of these tournaments. Obviously there's a cost implication. Uh, I also look at a scenario of if you had the national team, you know, you don't have to continuously play a Sikandar Raza or a Craig Irvin or a uh, Richie and Garava in a week's cricket tournament to see how they're playing. Uh, but at junior level, the development's a lot quicker or it's a lot slower. Um, and that's what we got to be very cognizant of. You know, we're still almost two years away from the next World Cup, which we'll be hosting here, is just understanding that youngsters develop at different paces and different times. Uh, but what are we looking for? What are we looking for in where we can develop that boy uh, in two years' time? And we've got to be cognizant of that on how we make that development. And then looking at that development, what kind of coaching has have these boys been ex, um, exposed to? So a lot of it has been just the provinces uh, ensuring that each team has a coach and a manager. I, I think probably tough for those coaches and managers to sort of get a bunch of boys together over five days and, and try and coach them. I think it's been more of a management role and a bit of insight from the coaches on game plans and that kind of stuff. I think what we need to be looking at is how do we incorporate, especially an under 17 or under 19 age group, in some kind of pathway within Zimbabwe cricket. So we have a, a provincial uh, team that plays Logan Cup and, and Pro 50. But what are we doing for the junior age groups? Uh, and I know that that's something that Zimbabwe cricket's discussing in, in how we start bringing in the juniors. Uh, is that a provincial B structure that will have a certain amount of junior cricketers? Is it a standalone 
provincial under 17 under 19 squad maybe um, like I said that's ongoing discussion to make sure that we have something moving forward that is not just expecting to change a, a cricketer's ability in five days in a week like this but to be able to go back and identify a player and go right he's got some talent but these are the things we need to work on so when we have another week or we have another game he's worked on that and he's getting better that's how we can develop those players and uh, so would that imply a sort of tracking system? I think a tracking system may be more for me, and like I said, it's not, a, it's not something that I get involved in at the moment, um, is probably the selectors. And once Zimbabwe Cricket announced that uh, new head coach, which is vacant at the moment, is for them to sit down and have a full squad of whatever that number is uh, and sort of discuss with, and maybe not totally identifying yet, uh, but to identify a certain amount of uh, players in the Mazvingo area that will then fall under a semi-high performance program, uh, one in Matari or wherever that one needs to be, one in Bulawayo, one in Arari, to ensure that those players that have been narrowed down into, let's say, players of interest, are starting to do a little bit of more high performance. My view is that those kind of players should be practicing with the provincial uh, senior men's side when cricket starts. That's how we toughen them up and make them better. Uh, so that's a start. It's not necessarily high performance specifically for a player, but it's ensuring that those squads are coming together, playing with the senior side, uh, brushing shoulders again with a Richie and Garava if you're a bowler, uh, a Sean a Craig Irvin rather if you're a batter. So, so that's how I would do it. So um, one of those is, is interests me is like, you know, a lot of people have been saying, what is Tuskers up to? Because the, the Tuskers uh, main team hasn't been performing well. But you look at the Tuskers uh, under 17 team, you've got kids like Rowan Conson and so forth, who are coming in and they're unbeaten. So it's showing that, uh, is that showing that there's a lot more happening under the bonnet than, than many people would think? So, so I think it's happening privately. Uh, I think a lot of it is happening within the schools and, and Zimbabwe Cricket has a perfect opportunity to tap into that. We need to tap into that. Uh, a concern, like you mentioned, needs to be down at the Tuskers Nets and playing with the main side. If he can play a couple of provincial games or B games because they feel that he's good enough, he needs to be doing that. We, we also need to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, for a lot of uh, players, uh, there's other sports that they play at school. Uh, it's a tough one because when we're playing winter sport as Zimbabwe cricket is now and, and we have our leagues around the country playing, uh, we'll go into NPL. Is, is a constant available? He might not be. He might be playing hockey, he might be playing rugby. So there's a management issue there that we need to deal with. However, we also need to develop the culture uh, of cricket within our schools, or of players uh, subconsciously or, or not that we're forcing the agenda, but that they're going to pick. They're going to pick the sport of their choice. And he's going to pick that as a CBC boy or wherever he is in Bulawayo, that he wants to go down to the Tuskers uh, nets and he wants to put his name in the hat for selection. We need to make sure that the platform is, how do you call it, it's attractive for those players to want to do that. And like I've said, the bowlers are easy. Your provincial uh, teams always need net bowlers. Those kind of bowlers in these provinces, youngsters should be down at provincial practices and bowling to the senior players. They're also brushing shoulders with the uh, provincial coaches. So they're helping. But all of a sudden you see a little bit of talent and you slowly integrate them. And, and that's a natural progression that we need to establish as Zimbabwe cricket. I see something that you mentioned there that, you know, looking at, I think a lot of the times nowadays, no one is really thinking about 17 year olds playing for their provincial side, but that used to happen a lot in your day, didn't it? It did, uh, you know, it, it happened at national level. I mean, just at the back there where the rugby structures are now, there used to be nets at the back. And every Friday there were national high performance nets. Every Friday afternoon, it started with under 15s at two o'clock, it went all the way to under 19s. And at four o'clock, uh, the national team arrived, your Edo Brandises, your John Tricosses, your Andy Flowers, they came down for national nets. The natural progression was the under 19s, which we were part of and we came through the system, would then have finished their practice. But guess what? I got to bowl to Andy Flower. At the end of that, there was a fielding session. The under-19s got to be part of that fielding session. So when you got into an opportunity to play uh, first league cricket or provincial uh, men's cricket, you already had that integration. And I think that we've fallen away from that. We need to find a way. We have a great structure within our school's cricket. Maybe the argument is they don't play enough cricket. How can we get them one playing more? 
How do we integrate them in a very structured environment in school cricket to just add that on to and bolt it on to the back of what we're doing at provincial level? My question B is, if the Mountaineers are, have a practice before a four-day game, why are they not practicing at Peterhouse uh, on their way to Arari for a game and incorporating all the Peterhouse boys and all the Wise Owl boys and, and dare I've left anyone out? But anyone else of interest that can come down to Peter House. So all of a sudden you, you're developing the understanding of what the Mountaineers are about. You're developing this uh, enthusiasm for kids to be part of that. I mean, could you imagine uh, the Eagles practicing at St. George's this Friday before a 50 over game on Sunday? And uh, you've got Richie and Garava bowling at the nets at St. George's to Eagles boys. And you've got the perceived Eagles under 17 boys part of that. That's how you develop, and we need to develop a culture of, of boys looking and going, that's what I want to be. I want to be part of that. I want to wear the Eagles kit. I want to be Richie and Garava. And that's how we integrate that. It's not a cost implication. We just need to go out there and be part of what these juniors are doing because they're structured anyway. Uh, I'm, I mean, thinking about that, probably be looking at how the Zimbabwe under-19 team went. You sort of felt like they'd been too used to playing against other boys if they'd had... Uh, uh, I'm getting from what you're saying that if they'd had a sort of system where they were exposed to, you know, older players a lot more, they might have might have been less dear under lights uh, type of situations. So it is a tough one, and and you know maybe because like you said they've been playing against boys a lot. You look at that England setup uh, of under 19s that just happened in South. You look at the Indian setup, the Pakistan setup. Half of those guys are playing, if not half more are playing men's cricket already. Now there's a challenge because, you know, the, the idea of wanting to be a jack of all trades and making sure during winter I play my hockey and I play my rugby and I've got tennis and I want to do triathlon and oh, by the way, maybe I'll play a little bit of cricket. Now, now that's a two-way uh, uh, issue there. It, it's making sure that Zimbabwe cricket has a platform that attracts players to, when you're deciding to choose, when you wake up in the morning and you're trying to decide what you want to do. Do I want to do a triathlon today? Do I want to go and play tennis, golf, or do I want to go and play cricket? How are we making sure that cricket is at the forefront of your mind? As opposed to cricket only being at the forefront of the mind every two years. That's unacceptable. So Zimbabwe cricket needs to make sure that we're continuously attractive for these kids or boys to make sure that they want to pick that as their sport of choice. So when Friday afternoon comes, what am I doing? I'm telling mum and dad, please pick me up, get me down to a Rory sports club because I'm going to train with the Eagles. I need to be there because that's what I want to do. We need to remove, and, and dare I sort of talk about all the other sports. It is, it, it's a contest out there. How do I make sure that that young cricketer wants to play my sport instead of your sport? That's the competition we face. So I don't, I don't apologize for that, but I look at it and go as a young cricketer, to be able to go to a World Cup and then have a look at how that career for you could develop is huge there's great opportunities in cricket all these t20 leagues and t10 leagues there's money to be made but we need to attract them as well and we need to make sure that they choose us as their sport of choice and come and commit their commitment our commitment we can only benefit from that one would argue that a lot of these boys don't even come to watch the national team and is playing or the women's team that is playing how do, how do you get that to be a, a sort of interest because is that's an easy pathway in some instances because we've seen it before when some youngsters were playing international cricket now say when they used to get bust in they would come and watch cricket but i'm talking about those that are already involved like those who are playing under 17 at the moment so now, i mean even domestic cricket coming to watch a, you know four day game for example so so here's maybe also something zimbabwe cricket could do uh, yep. i remember my uh, under 14 i think it was called partridges week so we had partridges at under 14s, we had fawns at under 15s, and then we had our under 19 structures. And I went through that whole pathway. But my under 14 coach when I played for Mashanaland was Andy Flower. Uh, one of the other coaches was Dave Houghton. Another uh, province or, or, or uh, club or team was Grand Flower. So what happens is that when you're brushing uh, shoulders with those kind of players, taking nothing away from the current management and coaches that we have, there's an element of aspiration. So when Richie and Garava is going down to this under-17 week and he's talking to bowlers, let me just tell you, the next time that Richie and Garava walks on this field, all those boys that have been part of Richie and Garava and he's touched their lives want to come and watch them. So bussing in is one thing. 
but there's no emotional attachment there. There needs to be an element of emotional attachment. And maybe we need to look at how do we use ex-players, current players, iconic players, to be part of that. And as opposed to them just watching, is to say, right, let's get Richie and Garava incorporated just for this week, uh, and even for half a day, just with the Eagles team. Let's ask uh, Ryan Burl to be part of the Rhinos team. Keep it within the provinces. All of a sudden, you'll see this development of these boys, even at the age of 17, going home and going, Mum, Dad, guess who I met today? Guess who was in my change room and he was telling me just about a grip or, or how to hit the ball down the ground. That's how the emotional attachment starts. So when Ryan Burl walks onto the field in his next one-day international, I can tell you those under-17 boys are sitting in the stands there because they have an emotional attachment already to him. So those are small little things that don't cost us any money. And that's what I'm saying. Those are ZC investments that we need to look at moving forward to ensure it's not just, ah, oh, under-17, we could go and play your cricket. And then in two years' time, we look at it and go, ooh, is our under-19s ready? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's a serious investment all the way down. And Eagles practice at St. George's to say, we're coming down there. You prepare the nets. Bring all your boys. Hellenic, come. St. George's, come. Uh, St. John's, come. All the Rari teams, come and be part of that. But I can tell you that all those Eagles boys are there, current, past, because they're part of those structures. You start getting that emotional attachment. Therefore, when the next Eagles game's on, those boys are now wanting to come and watch it, not because they were busted. So then, uh, how much autonomy is given or expectation is there from the provinces to keep get some of these things going? Look, I think sometimes you, you the provinces are busy. Um, they uh, are, are busy in making sure that they run their affairs and, and they run their affairs to make sure that they achieve what they need to achieve at that level. I, I think it's not a provincial issue, I think it's a Zimbabwe cricket issue. I think it's an issue that we need to look at as Zimbabwe cricket and say, hang on guys, let's not look at this, let's look at that. So when we're looking now at hosting the World Cup in 2027, we shouldn't be looking at results, we've got a national team going to Bangladesh. Yes, obviously those results are important, but how are those results going to play a part in what we want to achieve when we host the World Cup in 2027? So the under-19 structures are the same. So, so it, it sort of takes a game plan that's like this and makes it like this because you're saying to the provinces, your future is purely beholden to what you do with these juniors. So Eagles, great. You have all these schools in the right. How are you tapping them? You don't have to bust them in. You don't have to pay money to bring them here. Go to the people. Go to St. George's and net there. And ask all the schools to bring their players. So the minute that the, 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 the youngsters are finding out, all of a sudden, your Eagles coach, um, Eric Chaluka, is looking and going, Jeepers, where did this guy come from? What school is he at? Little phone call. Hey, coach at this school. Can you bring that guy down next week? You have a natural progression, you have a natural selection policy, and you're starting to develop this culture of this pathway that anyone in Harare goes through the Eagles. But what is that pathway, and what are we trying to achieve in two years' time? This week, yes, important. But what we achieve at the end of the week is not what's important. It's how we now take what we've done and sort of extend that, make it bigger, incorporate provinces, incorporate A-sides, and start moving that. And the kid also sits at school and he goes, I want to play professional cricket. But what's my pathway? I don't know. He now sits and goes, I'm crystal clear. I want to play cricket. I will be down there. And I think that's what we need to develop. And then uh, something personal for you. Your son is in the under-17 as well. It must be one of those where you're looking at everybody else, but also looking at, hey, well, how's my boy day? It is. Um, I, I think that I'm, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm a little bit more of a realist. Um, obviously, I want him to do well. Um, and, and hopefully that he can put his name in the hat for selection for 2026. 20, uh, uh, the discussions I'm having with him and, and some of the boys that I know that I'm not related to. Um, you know, again, it, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Where do we want to be in August 2025? And that's from a Zimbabwe perspective, and it's from an individual perspective. So I, I watch my son in this week, and I look at his results, and I sit every night, and, and we discuss, you know, uh, what did you think of your keeping as a wicket keeper batter? Yeah, good, maybe sometimes a little bit lazy. What do you think of your batting? Do you think you get maybe forward a little bit more on those slow wickets, careful of playing back? So 
So for me, it's more of an education of taking this week and seeing how much you can learn. Um, and understanding, like I said, uh, this should not be the end all and be all of an under 19 week. And that's why I haven't called it under 19 trials. I've called it an under 19 week. Where are the areas that you need to develop? So I'm hoping that what we're gonna do at the end of the week is have a look. I mean, I, what I have noticed is um, some of the bowling has been a little bit wayward, too many extras. So there's little things that holistically, not anyone in, in particular, what we can work on in our junior structure. So one is how can we be more consistent disciplining in our bowling? Too many wides. I've seen games there, 48 extras, unacceptable. So, so that's something that schools can work on holistically across the board. Good bowling means it makes me better batters. So I've ticked two boxes there. From a batting perspective, players, and there's been a lot of them which you would have noticed as well, even constant, 70, 80 out. A lot of players 40, 50 out, even my son, 35, 25 out. Why are you getting out? How do you make sure you bat 50 overs? So holistically, all the games that we've played, on, on arguably some tough wickets, they're slow and they're low. Uh, how many teams have batted 50 overs? Very few. So that's a, a, a straight away thing we can take back to the junior structures and say, how do you guys develop players to bat 50 overs? So one, uh, more discipline when we bowl. We don't want to see 50 extras in a game. Two, how do you get your batters to bat 50 overs? I'm not pointing fingers at a specific kid that, hey, we're watching that guy make him better. I'm saying let's make school cricket better because that will develop us better cricketers. So those are the sort of discussions I've had with him from a personal perspective. But I'm hoping that's what we can share with the schools after the week. The schools aren't here. But if they want evidence, I'll send them an email to say, here are the, uh, what is it, three games a day for 15 games. These are how many wides we bowl. These are how many no balls we bowl. This is how many players got into 20s and 40s. These are the lack of singles that we scored. I'm not mentioning any names, but how do we take that back to the schools and say, guys, let's make our cricket better by just focusing on these basics. And if we can do that, hopefully when we do another one in August or another one in December, we'll see the difference. That then allows the selectors to look and go, right, we've seen these guys develop. Now they're developing individually, but we're developing holistically. The cricket's more competitive, and now we're seeing development in our place. No, I'm just looking at that. I mean, I think one of the key, one of them, I call them the game changers. I'm, I'm looking at, at uh, the, the advert behind the Zimbabwe cricket app that even the schools could keep track of their players and just know in real time how they're bowling. And this oh, yeah. is, yeah, so this sort of gives you invaluable data, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I don't even need to look at the scorecards. I can go on there and get all the information I want. I can look at strike rates, I can see extras, I can see those that have taken wickets. What I can't see is the boundary counts against singles. And I think that's a junior thing. We all love hitting fours and sixes. So we do, we have a challenge within our school. So when August starts, we go into this T20 mode at school level. And I think that T20 in a way, uh, dare I say, has not ruined cricket. The, the benefit that it's done, it's allowed cricketers at all levels, even at men's senior level, to express themselves. The harm it's done is it's allowed an excuse that when a player gets out playing a weak shot, no, 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 he's trying to express himself. And you look at England at the World Cup in India, they were poor because they couldn't bat 50 overs. What was the reason for that? They're playing too many T20 cricket. And if you have a look at their history last year, before that uh, 50 over World Cup in India, none of their players played 50 over cricket. They all played T20 cricket. Now you're asking them to go and bat 50 overs. Now that's not an example at under 17 level. That's an example in arguably the defending champions in world cricket. So if that's an example we can use at international cricket, surely we can use it at our 17 level. How do we get boys to understand the value of batting 50 overs, regardless of how many balls you block? For me, and maybe I'm a little bit old school, and I had this chat with Courtney Welsh, it's great having him here in Zimbabwe with the ladies, and I said to him, I definitely didn't put myself in that bracket, but the, the, the sort of era that we played in with Courtney and Kirtley um, and probably uh, if I want to add there Shane Warne and, and Adam Gilchrist and I can name plenty of them. For me the 90s and, and before that cricket was probably more of a skill. You didn't play T20 cricket. So when you had to face Courtney Walsh you had to make sure that your technique was proper. Courtney Walsh had an unbelievable skill. I use him as an example. 
T20 cricket, I have to bowl four overs. I go out there and I smack the ball because the coach wants me to face 10 balls and score 30 runs. There's a skill and an art to be able to hit that ball out the ground, but the general basic of hard work and the mental aptitude and the skill level of the game has sort of, in my opinion, fallen away a little bit. We need to go back to that skill level. And Dave Houghton always said to me, he said, if you think you learn T20 cricket skills in T20 cricket, you're wrong. Because in T20 cricket, you're expected to face 10 balls. And Ryan Ball is a perfect example. You can't keep playing T20 cricket facing 10 balls and think you're going to develop. How do you develop to learn how to play extra cover by facing 10 balls? You have to play four-day cricket. Because time at the crease allows you to try different shots. You have to play 50 over cricket because an extended period of the crease allows you that. Extended bowling spells allows you to learn discipline. It allows you to test some Yorkers. The modern game, because it's so compact and short, uh, it's like, I need you to bowl me four overs. You bowl me one in the front, one in the middle, and two at the end. They're all different. I don't develop that skill. I don't develop the art of bowling. And I think that I'm not saying that schools should plop, stop playing T20 cricket, but let's be very careful of going away and learning those basics of the age-old technique of getting forward, elbow up, hitting it down the ground, and hitting it on the ground. And, and I think we need to get back to that. Bowling, make sure that we discipline. Bowl in a channel. I don't want to see any extras. And if you're disciplined and you're patient, a batter will go after something. But at the moment, if I'm indisciplined, batter knows. Uh, we're sort of seeing it in our provincial structures as well. In six balls, I'm going to get provincial level, four good ones, one okay, one and one bad one. In scoring, six runs and over. In schoolboy cricket, it's probably more like two good ones, two average ones, and two really poor ones. I can go at eight runs and over without even trying, but I'm still getting out. So those are, for me, that's what I want to see out of this week. I want the selectors and the convener and the coaches to be able to take a learning from what we've done this week, not worry too much about how we're selecting or what we're selecting, and go, right, guys, we've now seen what we believe is the best 84 cricketers in the country. How do we make that 84 better? What are the little things we need to change? So we want to work on that during the winter, and let's do something in August, and let's see where we're developing. Let's get hold of the schools and tell them this is what we want to work on. I, I can't imagine how that won't work. Okay, all the best.